Hey, Jody, welcome to the show. Hey, Ryan, thanks for having me. So it's, it's fun to be live here. So tell us about yourself and how you got here. You have such a fascinating background and an amazing 10, 12 year career already. So tell us a bit about yourself and how you got here, Jody. Sure, I will tell you every step in terms of just the milestones and then you can dive into whatever you want. So left university, had a graduate scheme that was a bit of a pattern interrupt in that it taught me how to think for myself in quite a big way. Started a business at 22, three years in, realized that although I had a team, my entire business relied so much on me that I couldn't take a holiday. Decided to do something about it. Spent about a year figuring out how to systemize my business and then doing it so that everything was automated, delegated or eliminated. And then spent five years running I guess what I would call a lifestyle business where I traveled for one month and every three had an amazing team on the ground looking after everything and yeah did that on repeat for five years and then COVID hit in 2020 so it was about eight years in we shrunk by 25% in one week and then spent the next four months growing back to normal and then a further 20% above that so had a bit of a crazy four months and then summer of 2020, took a long, hard look in the mirror and decided that now was the time to sell my business. Started down the route of selling, got a broker on board and the sale took six months. And now we are 18 months after that. Uh, that's amazing. So with, with a few things, first off, congratulations on your exit. It seemed like everybody rethought what they were doing in 2020, especially in the summer of 2020. Like, hey, do I want to keep doing, doing this? Um, I want to dive into your business a little bit and let's kind of work through that, um, that kind of acquisition and your, well, your exit, their acquisition. And then we're going to dive into your books too, because I just found out the book that we're about to talk about is your 20th book. So there's a few books that we're going to talk about here, Jody. Um, tell us a little bit about your business. And it was an agency. What, what did the agency actually do? Yeah, it was an agency that did social media marketing. So at the start, it was 2011. Social media was not the beast it is right now. We were convincing companies that they have to had to be on social media and we were setting up their profiles for them, which just seems crazy now, but that's what <laughs> we were doing at the time. And then we would do things like Facebook ads, LinkedIn, managing for various different clients, and we would become their content partners and put out stuff on their behalf. And within that, kind of framework you're you're on the beginning phases of where you know instagram i think was really early on i don't think it had even been bought by facebook yet or maybe it had in like 2011 12 maybe so you're early on at what point did you realize the business was tied to you and your team relied 100 percent on you was it when you try to take a vacation and the reason i asked this is we're going to you know get into lifestyle design but at what point did you realize hey i've got to systemize my business was there was there a point or a trigger there yeah. Yeah, it was, I was interviewed by a friend for her blog. So she runs the Female Entrepreneur Association and she'd interviewed me right when I started my business about all the intentions I had for my business. And then I looked back at that article because it just, I think it just popped up on my web browser somewhere. And I realized that I'd started the business so that I could travel. And the situation I found myself in three years down the road was that I couldn't be further from that. All this freedom I thought I was creating by having my own business. I hadn't done that at all. I just created myself a job. So it, was, it wasn't just that I was there all the time and I had to be all the time. It was that every client was speaking to me. Every sales call went through me. Every networking event was me. I was the face of it. And even though I had a team, they weren't really, I didn't, I didn't maybe empower them enough or train them enough or trust them enough to do their own thing. So that was the moment that just something had to change. And then you've talked about systemizing it. What are some actual tactics or processes that you implemented to get to that of like, you know, I'm sure it sounds like it was over a year. You learned how to systemize your business, implemented those things. What were some actual things you implemented there? I opened a fresh Excel spreadsheet and in column A, I wrote a list of every single process that happened within my business. In column B, I wrote who did the process now. And that was kind of easy because it was just all me. And then column C, I wrote who should do this in the future. And that was either someone I already had in my team. It was the name of a company I wanted to hire. It was the name of a role I wanted to hire, or it was just, a, oh, it was a software that I wanted to automate to, or it was just 
eliminate, stop doing because it was a silly process and it shouldn't have been happening <laughs> in the first place. And then column D was my plan of action. So it was, when was I going to train this person? When was I going to hire this person? When was I going to find this, com- this company to outsource to? And then I put all those different rows. There are about 60 when I'd finished the spreadsheet. I put them all in order of importance and I worked through that list. And I booked myself a five week trip to Australia that was three months in the future. And I gave myself a deadline for completing this spreadsheet and systemizing my business. And it wasn't fully done by the time I went, but the most important things were done. So I went. I love that. So what, when I, I'm looking at a business and when you have listeners that are looking at a business, a lot of times, especially if you have a partner, you don't know who's going to handle what within a business. And one of the simplest ways to do it is just open up an Excel spreadsheet, put the PL in there and put a name next to every single line item. And that's just, you know, of course you actually have the operations behind it, but as you start putting a name next to each line, you, you can't hide from it. You can't run from it. The, the switch that I thought was, was really critical for you is you actually started and flipped it based on what was most important so that you were working your way down rather than like, sometimes we, we want to attack something that's like the easier one. That's actually, yeah. it could be easy, but not that important. Right. And so you focused on it. And then the final piece is like, you always have to have some sort of deadline. So you knew that once you started implementing these, you were out for five weeks and this had to be like ready to go. Yeah, had to be. There was no choice. It was a 10 hour time difference. There was going to be no hiding. I was not going to compromise sleep to work through the night on this. So yeah, it had to be done. That, that's awesome. So, okay. So you're, you're eight, nine, 10 years in now it's 2020. You decide to sell six months is a very normal process for most businesses. I'd say if you're three months, it's really fast. If you're 12 months, it's a really long time. Tell us, so you decide to sell, what sort of gave you that Hey, I've been running this. It's probably your identity is tied up in this. You've been doing it for a decade, which is a third of your life. If you'd start it when you're 22, why, why sell, right? Like why sell and what made, what, what gave you that, that idea to sell? The thing that gave me the idea to sell was that we had grown a lot during COVID and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it again because I'd been very out of the business and I'd been traveling and I'd been able to dip in and dip out and live the life that I wanted to live but when you get that tap on your shoulder to say there's a pandemic we're losing all our clients you need to come and help us that I just didn't know if I wanted that again so I knew that if I carried on running the business I could go back to what I was doing before but that could happen again I knew that I didn't really want to go back into the early stages into the kind of execute phase and go again and get the business to a new level and I figured that selling was a really good way to remove myself as a barrier to growth for the rest of my team as well. And it was a good way to just draw a line under it and and move on. And I think the business that I would have started then at 32 was very different to the business I started at 22, because you think how much growth is in that time. And so maybe there was an element of me that had outgrown the business and maybe the business had also outgrown me. And I think that's a critical point. Everybody thinks that if someone is selling a business, there has to be something wrong with it. Well, if you think about, I've, I've never been part of the same business for 10 years, right? Like that's a very long time to, to run something and be a part of it and have it be sort of like part of your identity. And mm-hmm. I think what happens in these situations is you're ready for something new, right? You've obviously, we're, we're going to talk about your books here in a second. You've written 20 books. Would you still be writing books and, and putting out as much content as you do if you had all these employees and you were still doing that. So I don't think, and, and I think the other thing that's important to highlight, and I, and I see this in a lot of entrepreneurs is they sort of think that it's bad to, to say that the business has outgrown them because mm-hmm. it, taking it to the next level, then all of a sudden it changes their lifestyle. And, you know, or, you know, it, they would have to put back in a lot of stuff, a lot of the money that they're paying themselves. And like, it's kind of a big bet and you don't want to go through that 2020 again. So it's very real. Um, tell us briefly, agencies can be sort of tricky to sell, right? Because of the it factor that is usually found in the owner, you know, such as all the leads come to the owner, all the clients expect to talk to the owner. You systemized your business, which is very unique in the agency world uh, until you get to a certain scale and then it starts to, then it has to happen. What, uh, what, what business bought the agency? Was it sort of a a complimentary business that was going to cross sell or or who was interested in your agency? We had 
we had three offers and they were all other agencies and they were all other agencies who were either very well funded or very profitable and wanted to reach the next stage and wanted to acquire. So part of the reason why, well, going back to your past question, part of the reason why it was a good time to sell was because we had just come off the back of a growth phase, but also it was because I wasn't desperate to sell. And I think I wasn't desperate to sell because I wasn't integral to the running of the business. So that meant that the leads didn't come through me. No clients spoke to me. It just wasn't wasn't what we did they all had account managers and also the sales process that every single process wasn't me at all so I feel like that made us more attractive to a buyer because the owner wasn't integral to the business so it was probably quite easy for the new buyers to see for the new owners to see that it could slot into their processes and they didn't have to get rid of the person whose name was on the door yeah that can what that also forces the entrepreneur to do is spend an extra six months, year, two years, actually handing off all the clients. If you haven't done that before. Um, So one, you probably end up selling your business for less. And then two, you end up working for a boss for the next 18 months to try to transition everything. Yeah. Yeah, That that defeats the whole purpose. (laughs) So my handover took two weeks. Two weeks. That's incredible. I've never heard of an agency being that short. That's amazing. It just goes to show the power of systems and what you team you had implemented um, and that you truly were removed from, from that business. Um, okay. So it's been 18 months. Tell us, uh, you, you do a lot of interesting things all the way from writing books to powerlifting to traveling the world. So 18 months ago, you sold the business, bring us up to speed over the last 18 months. And we'll dive into some of these, these areas here. Um, I think selling your business is a very, very confusing thing. And it can be really confusing because no one seems to understand and you're trying to explain it, but all the problems that you have are very good problems to have. So I think I took a little journey going through that and figuring out who even am I? And I remember I really struggled with the question, what do you do for a long time afterwards? And someone asked me in the gym and I I ran away. I was like, I I don't know how to answer that question right now. So let's just not do that. But um, one of the main things I did was when the sale was going through, I was super impatient and you know what it's like, due diligence, dealing with lawyers, all that stuff. And I needed to channel this energy somewhere. So I wrote a book. So I wrote a book called 10 year career that looked back over the journey, what I'd learned, put it, into a framework and a system that other entrepreneurs could use to have their exit and not need to work again in a decade. As we, before we jump into the book, I think there's a critical point you mentioned is selling, selling your business. um, You sort of go through this identity crisis and like you kind of rethink a lot of things. It also happens on the buying side too. As you go and buy a business, all of a sudden you've got a new identity. And what I think is is tricky here is these are all sort of lonely, isolated experiences. Yes, a lot of people have gone through them before, but it's not like you can walk over to the water cooler and just like talk to everybody about it too, like, because there's no one to talk to about. These are problems that are good to have. They're typically first world problems, but they're still very difficult to go through. And so I think that's what makes it even trickier is, you know, people are like, oh, you just sold your business, you know, like, that's amazing. And you're like, yeah, but like, this is really hard because of, you know, all these other things that are going on in my, my new identity. And so nobody really wants to hear your problems. So right. it's helpful to have other people you can lean on who've gone through it before. Yeah. Then they're actually going to realize like there's some sympathy there for sure. Well, and journaling as well is a really big tool that can become your superpower because it's like everything that you're going through. So so say it's like a Monday afternoon and you're like, oh, I miss my team. Or you're like, oh, why, why is no one emailing me about that thing? And you, you almost, it's like your ego takes over and you want to be needed, but then you have to remind yourself that no, you're happy not being needed. This is what you wanted, but it does sometimes involve a journal entry and asking yourself questions and really get to getting to the bottom of what it is. And often it's that we're not comfortable in the space, like the space between things. We want to be moving on to the next thing. We want to know what it is. And even now I haven't updated my position on LinkedIn. I've just, there's nothing there. And LinkedIn keeps, left saying, <laughs> yeah, LinkedIn keeps saying to me, Jodie, you should really update your current position. I'm like, not you, don't you start. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Like it's, it's okay to not know. And that's the entrepreneur in us. It's like, we, we, we need to go from A to B to C, go to the next project. You got to be busy going, doing deals, whatever, and selling, building. And sometimes you, you just need some space to, to take a step back. Um, and in your space, you wrote 10 year career, reimagine business, design your life, fast track your freedom. And I sort of feel like you're living that to the T tell us about 
this this book? What can listeners expect from it? And we'll dive into a few things that I think are important for anybody looking for an acquisition here. Yeah, sure. So um, a part of the book is the 10-year career framework that is a four-step framework that goes execute, systemize, scrutinize, exit. And the idea is that throughout your entrepreneur journey, you will receive advice from everyone and you won't always know what to take in at what stage and I was definitely like this someone would say oh your prices are too high someone would say your prices are too low someone would say you should be out there saying yes to everything someone would say you should be sitting back and visualizing and letting the money flow and I'd be like who do I believe what do I do so the framework is a kind of antidote to advice that isn't right for you at that time so it helps you plot where am I what should I be doing right now and how do I progress to the next stage so the, there is actually a quiz it's at quiz.tenyearcareer.com that you'd be very welcome to take to find out which stage you're in but the um a big part of the book as well is unlearning what we've learned through the education conveyor belt and the career conveyor belt because sometimes we don't realize how much we are being led by whatever is going on around us and by the path expected of us that when we want to break away and do something different like have a 10-year career or like not have to work in our 30s or our 40s or whenever we have to think in a different way to to access that kind of success and that kind of path so let's let's talk about the the unlearning part a little bit and i think a lot of listeners are in corporate america or they're trying to make the sh- shift into entrepreneurship um that that's a daunting process and i think it actually stems from our educational systems all the way through up it's like you kind of it was our educational systems build, build us up to be factory workers. And we sort of our factory workers in cubicles as we continue to go forward. So what are some things that you think about when you are unlearning corporate America and then trying to make that shift into you own the equity, the buck stops with you, the, um, you know, uh, everything is going to be accountable to you as the business owner. I always think about my friend, Richard, because we were having a conversation about why his training had slipped and why he felt like he couldn't go to the gym. And he told me that by the time he got home from work, he was really, really knackered and he got home at seven or eight, it was dark and he just wanted to eat and he wanted to go to bed and he wanted to watch TV. And his commute was like two or three hours a day because he lived in London and he went into an office in the middle of London. And so he, he focused in the morning, he had lunch with his, with his co-workers, he kind of had a few chats over the water cooler, he looked at the clock until it hit five and then he went and it was all this stuff that he was describing about how mundane his day was, which all sounds completely normal <laughs> until yeah. you realise that Richard owns the business, it's his business. He's created himself a prison and he's just living it and he's not questioning it at all. And it sounds hilarious. Like it sounds like, oh, this is crazy. Who's this Richard guy? But like we all do it to some extent. And whether it's just we work on the weekdays and we don't work on the weekends or we clock on at nine and we clock off at five. There's there's these patterns that we've just become accustomed to that we're that we're still doing and we're not actually questioning. So the book goes through a whole way of questioning everything so that you can kind of take all the structure out and then put it back in in a way that suits you which might not be nine to five which might not be weekends and weekdays but it could be something else that serves you really well one of the shifts that i had too was when you, when i made the shift from um, employee to, uh, to entrepreneur and owning my own businesses was um, as an employee, you do look to that clock at five, 5 p.m. or you do look like, well, it's lunchtime. I'm, you know, I've got one hour to lunch. I got 30 minutes to lunch. And then you head out and you, you kind of do that, that sort of thing. Whereas when, it, when it's all relying on you and the accountability stops with you, sometimes you just work through lunch or, you know, what? sometimes it's a Thursday and you just want to take your kids to the zoo and you just do it. But you end up working at 1030 at night till 2.30 at night or 2.30 in the morning because that's when your kids are asleep and that's when it works. And so one thing I, I found was, you had to shift from it's time-based and you have these kind of time things that you're looking for, but more value creating it. it what, what am I creating and what are the value that I'm adding? And if it takes me 45 minutes, well, I can be done in 45 minutes. I don't have to sit here for four and a half hours yeah. just because uh, there's a desk here and, and, and a chair here. So I, I found that to be interesting in making that shift. When you, uh, so with you, you, you exit your business, you sort of designed your lifestyle around travel around your interests before you even quit your business. How did you, how did you go through that introspective 
because I think this is a different question for everybody. And where I'm getting at here, Jody, yeah. is everybody, when they're looking at buying a business, I get so many requests that says, Hey, is this a good business? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, do you like the business? Do you, do you want to run the business? Can you solve those problems that business needs? And so it's more important to look five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and sort of work your way backwards. I'm like, is this the lifestyle that, that I want? Is this the, 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 the problems that I want to solve? How did you go about doing that in your own life? There's a framework that I really like now that's that I kind of call your perfect repeatable day. And it's a bit of a thought experiment, but you know, Groundhog Day, the film. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Imagine you had to live every single day for the rest of your life exactly the same. This isn't actually what I'm going to make you do, but just pretend <laughs> that that's the case. So it, you could get a blank sheet of paper. You could write down every hour from when you want to wake up to when you're going to want to go to bed and put something in it in every hour that means that you would be very happy to live that day on repeat for the rest of your life. And I think the business that you're looking at buying has to fit in with that because no one's saying that you have to work for eight hours, but if you want to train and if you want to eat and you, if you want to hang out with your friends and your family and if you want to do interesting stuff in a business, it's like, when does that all fit in and what has to be removed in order for the good stuff to fit in? So I would look at potentially buying a business through that lens What's the actual day-to-day going to look like for me? And where does that go? And how does that fit in around my life? Because I don't think it's true that we have to choose between having an extraordinary life and owning an extraordinary business. I think we can do both, but I don't think it happens by accident. We have to plan it. It, One thing that's important too, I've just seen is a lot of times the people who are building great businesses and building great lives at the same time, they sort of uh, aren't getting the attention that like an Inc. 5000 or being on the front page of, of, you know, business or whatever, right. They're just not being talked about because it's all about, Oh, who raised the most amount of money? Who, who had this like, you know, once in a billion exit type thing. And so I think that's a critical piece. And, and, and rounding that up, it's you, you kind of, you're not going to, just fall into that. Like nobody, nobody falls into their ideal lifestyle. It's something that's got to be planned out and designed and it doesn't happen overnight. So with your example, you said you spent about a year working on your systems to understanding the systems that you needed to implement. And then you implemented them and gave yourself a three month window to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You need constraints. I also like to think in terms of your profession and your obsession. And for some people, their profession and their obsession is exactly the same thing. And that's fine. But if you think about it in terms of it has to be different, your profession and your obsession have to be different. And maybe your family is your obsession. But having both in place means that one of them has to stop when the other one starts. And I think that's quite a magical way of splitting them up, creating boundaries, because then it means, well, I can't continue working through the night because I'm going to go train or I can't do, you know, you know, there's something has to stop when another one starts. And not only does that mean that you're more effective with your time, but it also means that your default mode network, like the area of your brain that's going to be switched off and whirring away in the background can actually get to work. So I think looking to have both of those can make your work time even more effective. And then it also creates some kind of balance in your day that means that your work and your life are separate, but they complement each other at the same time. You know, it, when you're saying that it's gone through, so just recently I ran a, an, an ultra race. It's a long race. You run in the mountains. You basically run all day, right? Um, if people saw how slow I ran, they would not think it's that special, but it's, it's a race that, you know, not very many people finished. I think there was probably 150 people who sign up and only hundred people finish. Right. But what's interesting about that, Jody, is when, when I'm training for a big race like this, and this probably fits into you do powerlifting is, um, sometimes I'll be up at three in the morning or four in the morning to get a big run in before it gets too hot. You know, in the summer, it gets pretty toasty. I don't want to be running at, you know, three in the afternoon when it's a hundred degrees outside, but to me, that just sounds miserable. So you end up getting really early. Well, what that does is it forces me that like, Oh, if I need to do, if I need to be up by, by three 30 or four and be able to hit the trails by then it kind of works myself backwards that I need to go to bed at a certain time. I can't do certain things such as like, you know, mindlessly watch Netflix, which is sometimes fun when Seinfeld's on there and then kind of work your way backwards to like, okay, well, this is when I need to be done. This is when I spend time with my kids and my wife. And so you you sort of have these built-in constraints. And what I'm getting at is if you don't have any of those, you can sort of just let work, life, your Slack messages just sort of take over everything. And so how have you done that? You know, you're a power lifter. So, um, 
is that something that you started 18 months ago? Or is this something you've been doing your whole life? And how has that been built in around your businesses? I've been training for about eight years. I've been competing for about six years and competing internationally for the last four years or so. Yeah, I think I had my first international four years ago. So um, how it's worked, probably similar to your ultra running. You, when you're when you're lifting, you can't be thinking consciously about work because you'll get hurt. You have to you'll hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in my in the back of my mind is all the work stuff. It's just work. I just have to trust that it's there. It's working. My brain's wearing away, and it means that when I get to my desk and my laptop, the stuff will just happen because my mind's been processing it. So I like intentionally keeping them as separate like as separate as possible so when I train I'll put my phone on airplane mode I, I on purpose won't think or talk about any work stuff when I'm doing it and it's the same the other way around I think guarding the time between your profession and your obsession is so unbelievably important because I think multitasking is for losers and no one wins <laughs> when you multitask because losers, you're, not giving, yeah. you're not giving your all to either and it's just not a recipe for success at all. So boundaries, massive boundaries in between the two. And if I'm doing, you know, eight years ago when you started powerlifting, that was probably about the time that you started to systemize your business. So actually improving, improving your business and putting in the right systems allowed you to have all these other interests that, you know, sort of complement each other, even though they, on paper, they shouldn't complement each other. Yeah. Um, but I think you have to, between your profession and your, your profession and your obsession, I think you have to know which one wins out. You have to just be honest with yourself, which one wins out, because I've never, ever skipped a gym session for a work thing, but I've skipped work things for gym sessions. So in my head, obsession comes before profession, but it doesn't, I don't think it matters and everyone's going to be different. But as long as you know, you're not going to be kidding yourself, pretending that one thing matters to you more when actually it's the other way around. That's powerful. Which one wins out when push comes to shove? And yeah, you know, into your head. If someone said you can never train again, or you can never run an ultra again, or you can never work again, you have to know. You don't have to say it now, but you have yeah. to know which one you'd pick. Well, I, I don't think there's a right answer for any one individual. So I think that's yeah. an important distinction. Is sometimes it's it's okay to to be different than someone else. Yeah. Um, with with just a few minutes left, Jody, uh, you wrote an interesting book called How to Raise Entrepreneurial Kids. Okay. So a lot of listeners have kids or some of the listeners will eventually have kids. Um, I have kids that are starting to understand money and things cost money and all those things. And so my son has his little chicken business where he sells eggs to our neighbors and things like that. Um, give us, give us a top couple tips of how to raise entrepreneurial kids before we wrap up. Yeah, sure. So the book came about as a HARA request. So it stands for help a reporter out. I put it out there. I asked the internet, how, how are you raising entrepreneurial kids and how were you raised to be entrepreneurial? Thought I might get a few responses and I got 500. And so put wow. them all together into a book, wrapped a load of my experience because I, I had a, my mom was self-employed since I was about 14 or 15, joined up with a co-author who's got three kids under the age of seven and is raising them to be entrepreneurial. And we put it all in there with heaps of tips, actionables, guidance, stories. But one of the biggest things is throwing people in the deep end, throwing kids in at the deep end and letting them be independent and learn independence and learn resourcefulness. So um, there's plenty of examples of this in the book, but one from my experience was that from when I was about six, if we ever went away on holiday or away for a night or anything like that, it was up to me to pack my own suitcase. And it was also up to me to book my own doctor's or dentist appointments when I was five or six. So my mom would be like, you know, it's you know, you know what's going on. You know, it's time for the dentist. You know where the phone book is. You know where the phone is. You need to book it. And so it would just be up to me. And I didn't realize until... I was probably like 20 that other kids didn't do that I just thought it was totally normal but it does just teach resourcefulness it teaches you to not be afraid of the phone it teaches you to just get stuff on get it booked and and get it sorted and I feel like that's a big part of my entrepreneurial journey and lots of the entrepreneurs I've spoken to they had something in their childhood that they were just trusted with that they owned that was up to them and they just got on with and they didn't question it so if there are opportunities for moments like that I think it can only serve someone well for their future I love that with 
when, when you were saying that, I, I thought to myself, there, well, there was, a, there was a tweet that went viral a few years ago. It talked about, you know, being an adult and adulting. And it was when they hit 18 that they realized they had to, you know, book the dentist themselves. And I was like, really? That's like an adulting thing? Like, that just yeah, seems yeah, like yeah. you just called the dentist or sent them a text and, you know, they book it for you. Um, I have a friend who, um, when, when they're, I think it's when their kids turn 12, they let them, they, they have them book like a three-day weekend getaway. And they get to, they get a certain amount of like a budget for it. And it's like a trip and it could just be somewhere they drive to. It doesn't need to be like you fly across the world or anything, but the 12 year old is in charge of planning everything. And they have a budget they have to fall within. They, they plan the hotel, they plan the activities, they plan um, how they're going to get there. And the only thing my friend will step in and do is um, save the day. If they run out of money in their budget to bring everybody home, that's it. That's all, that's all there is to save. Cause if you run out of money on day two and you're supposed to be there for day threes, day three, well, he, he, you know, he, he saves the day and packs everybody up and you go home. So, uh, and he said, that's, that's uh, right. it's been an interesting experience because you kind of get all these different things from project managing and having to like book things online or call a hotel or like think about, Oh, well, we can't go to this do this, you know, crazy fun activity because we have this budget that we need to go within. So I thought that was very applicable there. Um, Jody, you're, you're all over the internet. You're, you're putting out a lot of content books. Where can people find you and follow you and learn more about what you're doing? So the best place to find me is jodycook.com, J-O-D-I-E-C-O-O-K.com. Feel free to send me a message. There's a contact form there, or you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, anywhere you want with all the links on that site. Awesome. We'll link that in the show notes. Thanks so much, Jody. And oh, by the way, your book comes out November 15th in the US, but it is out internationally. I don't know why here in America, it's coming out longer than everybody else, but I'm excited to read it. I've already bought it and it's getting shipped to my Kindle. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. 10yearcareer.com is that as well. Thanks.